Welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. Today, I'm honored to have a good friend of mine on the show, Diego Gutierrez. Diego was instrumental in the founding and growth of one of the most successful Bitcoin communities in the world in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He's also the founder of Coibanks and the founder of Rootstock. Diego, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. When did you first get into entrepreneurship? Well, I, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Uh, well, since I'm 12 years old, I, I, I used to to help build um, certain uh, publications, neighborhood publications, to communicate, you know, the interest of the neighbors. So I was a social entrepreneur since I was 12 to till I was uh, maybe 21, 20, wow. 22. And, and then I, and, and when I was 17, I started being a tech entrepreneur. But it, I don't recall a time where I was, I was not starting up. Uh, sometimes I was starting up things within corporations, but I was always starting up new projects. That's kind of the answer. <laughs> and, and bring us up to now. Uh, what have you been working on since you started that publication? Well, I, 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 when I was uh, 19, so a, a little bit earlier, I, I, I created the first website for the main newspaper in Argentina. That was back in 1985. Once I, I realized the, the potential of the web, I, I decided I was going to commit my, my entire life to it back then. And in my vision back then, communities were the strongest uh, feature of, of the web. So being able to connect people with common interests uh, around the globe, no matter where they were, was uh, what I was pursuing. So I started creating all sorts of communities, mostly you know topic-based communities. Of course, I, I didn't foresee Facebook, but I, but I had this idea that you know communities were were going to be the thing. So. Um, and, and then I, I, I also started creating applications for the education sector for, to, to organize, to, to create communication tool between the, the fathers, the teachers, the administrative part of the school. And then I, I, I created a bigger system that included also the, the education, the ministry uh, of education of, of countries or provinces. Uh, so, so you know, with that same concept of using the web to connect people, to inter- to exchange uh, information, uh, to plan the development of the educational system back then, uh, and that was my my last major uh, project uh, on my way on my first stage on my on my web uh, career, and and then I I, I took a a two years leave and I went to live on a sailboat uh, for a couple of years uh, because, well, the, the, the web, cra- we had this internet crash, the developed cra- the internet bubble crash. And, and we always talk with a friend of mine with Wences Casares, we always say we kind of lost hope <laughs> on the project. <laughs> uh, and that's something we, we promise each other not to do it again. And then, and with Bitcoin, we, we decided to go all the way uh, because, you know, back then it, it, when we, we had this vision about what the web was going to be and how it was going to change the world. Uh, but it was not the timing. I mean, it was 2000 was not the year, uh, but our expectations were that it was going to happen just then. Mm-hmm. And it took maybe 10 years more because you needed other cultural achievement, uh, you know, developments and also you know, to, to have ubiquitous access to the internet through mobile devices. So there were many factors that were not ready there, that ready yet. But 10 years later, our vision and our uh, hopes for the web became a reality. So uh, our lesson from that is that if you really believe in something, you have to, to keep going. Stay with it for know. the long term. Yes, for the long term. And uh, Diego... You've been yes. traveling a lot lately. How does how does the internet usage in Argentina differ compared to U.S., China, Europe? 
do people in Argentina use use the internet differently? Well, I, I would say Argentina, if you talk about Buenos Aires is one thing, the rest of Argentina is a quite different thing. But it, but still in Argentina, the, the technological penetration is, is huge. It's like uh, we, we are some of the countries with the, I don't know, highest Facebook adoption, uh, mobile phone, smartphone adoption. It's like in Latin America, it's like always leading the way. And then right. that, that comes uh, back to cable TV to, I mean, there's many things, uh, broadband, internet access. So Argentina is very special in that sense. And, and also it has a long tradition of, of entrepreneurs. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, we don't have the infrastructure that you you might find in in the U.S. or in Europe, but you have the conditions. I mean, you have you have a lot of entrepreneurs trying to to build things with technology, and then a lot of curious people trying to to embrace technology and put it into into their day to day life. Right. Regarding China, is it's a different thing altogether. Uh, <laughs> the the Great Wall of China drove me crazy for the first day, first four days until I find a way to first I was creating my own uh, like firewall then <laughs> then I find out there were some VPN solutions you what are use. you not able to use in China I haven't been there well no no fa no Facebook uh, worse than that because I, I don't use Facebook that much but worse than that is no no good at Google at all so <laughs> You know, no access to Gmail, no access to. So for me, it was like uh, crippling at the beginning. Uh, so to the point, I was setting up my own VPN to to, to <laughs> get out of China, and then I find out, you know, there were easier ways to go. To go, but uh, that was. And at the same time, is is weird because you have this problem with the Western, you know, applications or companies. But within China, everything works perfectly. And they have their own ecosystem. It's like you have WeChat, and WeChat is everything. WeChat is your equivalent to our WhatsApp plus a Facebook, where you, people publishes moments, uh, plus a payment system. So it's also a wallet. So it's, it's very interesting because it's not that the internet is not working. It's just that it works very well within the boundaries of that country. Right. So if you stay with, you know, Chinese telcos and, and Chinese technology, then you can do everything within those boundaries. The thing they is, have a nice if, walled garden, but it's difficult to get outside. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I think at the end, everybody that needs to get outside, they, they manage to do it. They, they just set up a VPN, pay for it. I mean, at the end, it's only a restriction for the masses, not for the the more, you know, the, the more tech savvy users. So anyone that wants to can access the outside internet with limited or no, or no, no restrictions. Y yes. I mean, they, they, they find a way to do it. Yeah. Mean, if, if you are an internet uh, developer or you will, you will have the tools <laughs> to go outside. Nothing can stop you. <laughs> yes. So Diego, I know we've talked and I've, I've heard the story before, but I'd love for you to share your story of, of getting into Bitcoin and the, the formation of the Buenos Aires Bitcoin community, which for those that aren't familiar, is one of the strongest and, and uh, highest numbers and most connected in the world. Yes. And then we have a beautiful Bitcoin center as well. It's, it's a, a beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's getting nicer and nicer. And uh, at the end of the year, when we do the BitConf, if you can visit us, uh, you will see all the improvements and we plan to throw parties and, and enjoy have a, a great time with Bitcoiners from all over the world there. And then regarding my my initial uh, you know steps in Bitcoin is that I mean the first the first uh, contact I had was uh, through a friend of mine who, who is a hacker and then he was like just playing around and then showed me this thing and the truth is, I didn't realize it, the full potential of it. At the beginning, it was like more play money. <laughs> For me, it's like what, that was my first thought. Uh, it was being used in Asia. Some people was like getting paid with with, uh, with Bitcoin for for services. I mean, it was interesting, but uh, you know, you see a lot of new technology all the time if you are in my field. So it didn't like click at the right at the beginning. 
And and then I, I would say six or nine months after we had this conversation with Wences and he was like completely psyched about Bitcoin. So he was showing me and he showed me the again, like more the transfer aspects like saying, you know, I can send you I, I think he sent me like 5000 Bitcoins or something like that. Uh, and then I was like wondering you know, if it was true because I had like 60K or something like that in my computer there. And, and then I sent them back. But that was like, you know, it was, of course, it was interesting to, to have a more hands on experience. But then after that, something like started to, to intrigue me. And what I did is I started searching the web for, for more articles. And I, and I, and I got with the Eric Boris article, a libertarian view on Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that, I, I was like, I don't know, 15 days uh, reading about Bitcoin in, in every aspect. Like uh, I started reading about micro, microeconomics, uh, the technology behind it, uh, you know, everything. And, and because I, then I realized that the social impact that Bitcoin could have. And then is when I really clicked and then I decided to devote my life to, to Bitcoin and, and, and its development. And, and I talked my, to, my, to my partners back then in the web development company I had back then. And, and I told them, you know, guys, uh, please take over this because I'm, I'm going to devote my life to, to Bitcoin in the next uh, years. And, and like with any new technology, you're, you never know where it's going. So I decided to do everything there is related to Bitcoin. So I started uh, offering, you know, uh, going to local Bitcoins and then gathering in cafes with people to to buy Bitcoins, to know who was using it. Uh, And then also, you know, meeting with people to sell Bitcoin. So I started like to build a reputation and then to learn about the, the people using it. I bought a mining a GPU machine and started mining, uh, like everything. And, and as I'm a very social person and I like, you know, I, I had this background of building like grassroots movements from my teenage uh, time. And, and then the next step for me was like to start to build a meetup. And and somebody already had made a, the first gathering and uh, and then, you know, I decided to set up the meetup, and on this first meetup, I met Rodolfo and Franco, and and we, the three of us, share this passion and this need to to create an environment where Bitcoin, the technology, could thrive, and and you know, and show its full potential. It's, I mean, the rest is history. We started like with uh, a 25 people meeting, then it suddenly became a hundred people meeting in this very small space where we couldn't fit. Um, we used to meet at, at the McDonald's back then. <laughs> <laughs> that was our office and, and, and plan how to conquer the world. I, I always say like in, in April 2013, I told Rodolfo, you know, I want to create a, a Bitcoin network, a network of Bitcoin communities in Latin America. And, and the funny thing is he didn't uh, call the, the the shrinks. So they, they <laughs> <laughs> instead of that, he said, "Okay, let's. Why don't we create the first uh, Latin American Bitcoin conference?" And and at the end of the year, we did it, and it was an, an amazing experience. Uh, like top, you know, thing leaders from all the region came, uh, and that's also when I started Coibans with the idea of creating the the bank of the future, what I call the the democratization, uh, you know, of, of access to investing and, and, and to financial tools that now are only available to certain, uh, you know, level of, uh, wealthiness. And that's something uh, that a lot of people from North America don't realize is that in Central and South America, there's not a lot of investment options out there for anyone except the super rich. There's no, you know, it's hard to get into the U S stock market or the local stock market. And there's, you know, exactly. the bank or your mattress. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, people usually opt for the mattress <laughs> because <laughs> especially in Argentina. Are, yes. I mean, in, in Argentina, we had this 2001 crisis where 
all the banks uh, collapse and default. So, so at the end, people is usually saving in in foreign currencies, in dollars, or and and use their their mattresses. And and you have very like, there's there's such a big distortion that sometimes people buy cars as a as a way to protect their wealth. That you know you know that it's not a pro- wealth protection, but sometimes the cars don't depreciate at the same rate that the the currency does because we. We were having something like thirty uh, percent inflation per year. Wow. So yes, <laughs> uh, and and you know, and that's that's one thing. It's like the the middle class, the the lower middle class, don't have many options to to invest to 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 protect their wealth. But if you go to the lower stratus, you know, to the poor people, then is it's not like even basic savings because the mattress is not safe enough because you you are in a slum so when you leave the things under the mattress and you go to work you are praying that nobody gets in your house and robs the the few uh things you have you have saved over your life so so that's why that led to to that the other project that i started with the ngo called sistema de uh, that started at the end of 2014. The idea started there uh, because we wanted to do uh, an auction to gather funds uh, to donate to to a group to an NGO that was working with uh, social entrepreneurs in Islam called Villa 31. And and well and you know the technology was not there yet because uh, you didn't have smart contracts and exposing people to Bitcoin volatility, to poor people to Bitcoin volatility is not an option. So you need a way to, to create stable assets. Uh, you know, and then that's when, when I, I had this idea of creating like a monetary system based on stable assets, but with no uh, trust on third parties, with full collateralized uh, assets. So you could issue I don't know, thousand pesos and put ten thousand pesos in Bitcoin as a collateral. So you had ten times uh, the the amount you are issuing. So the person holding the the what the issued crypto pesos knows uh, those crypto pesos will always be backed by something that is transparent and is there because it's Bitcoin's hold by a smart contract. But then I realized that there were no there's there was no no meaning to do that. With, with the trust on a third party. Because smart contracting, distributed smart contracting was not there yet. So you have centralized smart, smart contracting, but then you were falling into trust for somebody else. And, and what I wanted to do is to do a financial inclusion system that didn't rely on anybody. And so uh, you needed to build the technology that didn't exist uh, yeah. already. <laughs> and so then formed Rootstock, right? Yes, that's correct. I mean, I, I was with this idea, and and at the same time, I I was in Palo Alto, and and I happened to 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 meet with Nick Savo. And when I say I happened to meet with Nick Savo, is I was in a bar, and a friend of mine told me, you know, let me introduce you to somebody that is nearby. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly Nick Savo appeared. We were with two friends, and. And we were sharing like a glass of white wine, and, and I was discussing these ideas that, you know, what, and I was wondering why Ethereum, instead of leveraging on, on what Bitcoin has built over the years, on the ecosystem, on the network effect, decided to, to build everything from scratch, you know, to build their own token, their own security model, security network. And, and Diego, and to, felt, to back up real quick before. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so just. Uh, <laughs> For, for our listeners that don't know what Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Rootstock are, could you give a quick high-level uh, just explanation of what they each are and then the differences? Yes. I, I think Bitcoin, in, in my point of view, no, because uh, Bitcoin means so many things to, to so many people, but does, in my point of, of view, Bitcoin is the best uh, and the, the most neutral uh, settlement network there is. So if you want to settle the transfer of value between two parties without any intermediary, uh, and when I talk value, I talk in the in the wide sense, not only money or currency. It can be the title of your property. It can be a vote, uh, anything that 
that has value for a human being uh, and you want to settle it for good and, and without trusting anybody, Bitcoin is the, is the network for that. But then in, uh, for security, for security reasons, you cannot have a full Turing complete scripting language on Bitcoin. You cannot have states of the script execution. So there are some certain limitations that uh, stop you from from developing certain use cases that like the one I was describing, you know, like having a stable asset or not stable asset, a, a pegged asset to the fiat currency of a country that has a collateral in Bitcoin. And a smart contract uh, gives you that functionality. So somebody say, okay, Bitcoin needs, I mean, we need this other functionality in order to unleash the, the potential of cryptocurrencies. Uh, and I agree on that. And then this team of people led by Vitalik Buterin decided to create Ethereum. And, and as I said, they, they took certain strategic decisions. One of them was like, instead of using Bitcoin as the fuel, as the currency to pay for smart contract execution, they decided to create a new currency. So you have to create the new liquidity, uh, you have to create, you know, adoption or for, for I mean, the wallets and everything, all, all the things that Bitcoin already built. So uh, that was one decision they made. They say, okay, I will create it from scratch because they use this token as a way of funding their project, which is, is okay. And then the other thing they decided is that they wouldn't use uh, the Bitcoin network to secure their platform. So they created uh, a new uh, network based on GPUs and CPU, much like uh, the Bitcoin network was in the beginning. So they started building the security model from scratch. So that was the second decision. So as I think the idea of a smart contract is the necessary one, and I, and I think of the cryptocurrencies ecosystem as a layered system where you have as I said, Bitcoin as a settlement network, then you need a smart contracting network on top of that with, you know, certain, that also overcomes some limitations of Bitcoin, like having uh, shorter valuation times because 10 minutes is, is too long for certain purposes. Uh, as I said, a full scripting language where you can do anything you, you want and, and states and, and memory of the script of the last execution of a contract. Uh, so the idea is perfect, but you know, as as I see those two, th two things detach, I see Ethereum detached from Bitcoin. I realize what we could do if we really wanted to for this to work in the short term and, and with a more pragmatical perspective, not maybe looking for the best solution, but for the good enough for the short term. I, I decided like to to join forces with Circuit Learner and build Rootstock that basically uh, brings the smart contracts to the Bitcoin ecosystem. So it uses Bitcoin security, Bitcoin token, and, and it has its own blockchain to, to execute smart contracts. So that's so, basically the three, <laughs> the three elements. Yeah, thank you for the, the, the <laughs> overview. Now, you, your main focus is Rootstock, right? Yes, I, I'm, I'm this, the acting CEO of Rootstock, so so my, my focus is there. I'm, I'm kind of a bridge between different groups of people that are pushing different projects. Like I said, Sistema D, it has a lot of people working on it, like uh, almost 20 people, and, and it's interconnected with people in Chile, Brazil, and Argentina, so some experiences are being developed in the slums in, in all those places and and those projects rely on Rootstock for their full uh, development so so now we are running pilots but the idea is that all those projects will run on top of Rootstock and the right. same goes for Coibax. Coibax is developing its platforms uh, with the with the objective of, of running those platforms on top of of Rootstock. So yes, my, I'm I'm pushing Rootstock, but at the same time I'm I have my partners for the NGOs and and for Coibanks that are pushing the other things at the same time. Let's focus on you a little bit and and talk more deeply about entrepreneurship. F through all of these projects that you've worked on, what do you know today that you wish you would have known, you know, ten years ago before you started 
Coinbase before you got into Bitcoin? Well, I, I think one, one very valuable thing I learned over the years is that success in entrepreneurship uh, doesn't have to, to do with having the, the best idea not even having the the best uh, you know execution uh, capabilities or abilities of course that's very important but it, it's a combination of things and, and I think endurance is, is the most important thing on an entrepreneur because when you start something you you have an idea of what you want to do but the truth is reality always uh, changes the, the scenario or changes even uh, your assumptions so you know, persevering in, in in achieving a goal is more important than having the perfect idea from the right from the from the get go. And and for me, the three things that lead you to success are, you know, having a good idea, being able to execute properly, but also the timing. So so if the conditions, as I said, you know, back in the two thousand back in two thousand, uh, we had the good idea, we were executing pretty much, pretty well. But the timing was not right because the conditions of the environment were not good. And the only thing that, you know, can overcome that is perseverance. Because if you try and you switch and you try again and you try and try and try and try, eventually timing will be on your side. Now, of course, you can start looking at the environment and, and seeing if there are certain elements there or not. Uh, I mean, it's not something that it's not about trying, uh, you know, blindly, but but that's important to, to know that uh, no idea starts and ends the same. I mean, uh, no idea or, or, or project idea starts uh, the same as it ends being uh, successful. So, so that's, a, that's an important thing for me. And the other thing is that if you are building startups and, and at the beginning you are with very small teams, you, you need to have very highly motivated people and all of them have to be part of the, the vision. I mean, you, you have to really build a, a shared vision because a small teams of highly motivated and, and highly skilled people is, uh, is crucial. I mean, and how do you find those people? I don't know. Usually their eyes are bright. <laughs> they have that 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 little light <laughs> in the back of their eyes. I mean, it's like uh, I, I know it's difficult to to know, but it, you can see passion when somebody talks about things that they care. I mean, if if somebody has passion for something, it's more likely that will be passionate for for most of the things they do. So, right. I mean, for me, it's important to see that that somebody is passionate about something. Not necessarily what I'm looking for, but you know, to see that passion on something. That's what, for me, defines uh, doers and, and entrepreneurs. You know? And let's see if we can learn something from one of your failures. You've had a lot of successes so far, and you've got a lot of projects going on. Could you tell us about a time where you failed and, and what, what that resulted yes. in? The other thing I learned, because I, I also failed uh, because I was too diversified, I mean, that's I like I'm I'm like eager to learn and to to absorb knowledge all the time and I every project I I see I like <laughs> I want to go, to go after it <laughs> so <laughs> so at times I was so diversified that I couldn't do anything well so that's the other thing it's like even if you are tempted to to do too many things at the end if you want to do one thing well you have to focus and and push you know put all the energy into that project until it fails or or succeeds but it doesn't make sense to i mean it, it doesn't pay to be too diversified now now i'm i'm connected to many projects but each project has people who is pushing it it's not that i'm, I'm the i i i mean aside rusto which i'm of course leading but on the other projects i'm and even in rusto i have like my, my five co-founders which are all like pushing with me. So it's, um, you know, it's important. It's important to focus on, on one thing and do that thing uh, properly. Even you see a lot of good opportunities out there. And I would say another thing is, is this I was mentioning. 
uh, find find good partners because being alone that's another mistake I made. I for a long time I was leading one company without a partner, and um, and that's that's tough because you you have to take decisions and you don't know if your decisions are good or wrong. So it's always good to have a um, another point of view of something you respect to give you a different perspective. Right. And it's always, you know, my, you take smarter decisions in that way. So that's another thing. Cool. Well, thank <laughs> so, you for sharing. Uh, no, 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 you're welcome. I'm happy to share. If you could create a tweet that would go viral and get a, you know, get good percentage of the world's population to read that tweet, what would it say? Well, my, my message would be, you know, your life starts when you know yourself, when you know what's the, your purpose in, in life and in the world. So you have to always be, even if you don't know it and you don't find it, you have to always be looking for that. I mean, look for your purpose in life, because once you connect with that, uh, everything is certain. There's no more doubt. Nice. And to wrap up, uh, could you, uh, do you have any asks for our audience? Um, any, anything, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, contact info, uh, anything at Rootstock, if you're looking for people to yes, hire or I, promote. And then yes, we are, we are hiring people in Rootstock. So we are looking for cryptographers, uh, software architects, uh, senior software architects, but anybody, I mean, that, that can contribute value to you. Development. Is that a uh, distributed team or is everybody in Buenos Aires? Well, right now we are pretty focused in Buenos Aires, but we plan to grow uh, um, on a, I'm part of a, our second stage of expansion will be to open offices in main cities in the world. So, so we are looking for people everywhere. It's not that we are, but, but now we are, we are pretty much uh, located in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, they can reach me at dgz at rootstock.io and, and also at Twitter, it's Dieguito, D-I-G-U-I-T-O. Uh, so, so do you know, those are the... Yes. Do you know when the next Lubbock Conf will be? Have you uh, yes. settled on yes. a, a Oh, that's, that's a good one. I mean, that's the best way. I mean... If you want to have fun <laughs> and learn a lot and, and exchange a lot of ideas, uh, come to La Bitcoin. It, it will be the 5th and 6th of November this year in Buenos Aires. So, and, and that would be tons of fun. Well, you, you have been in La Bitcoin, uh, so, so you know. I have been to all three <laughs> previous La Bitcoins, and I can attest that it's uh, the best time you can have, and you'll learn more than you uh, can anywhere else about Bitcoin in Latin America. And of course, in Argentina, you've got the benefit of the best steak and wine in the world. Yes, and tango and many, many interesting things, many fun things. So, so and the Bitcoin Center, we will use it. Great. Uh, throw party. So that that's a good one. I, I would say, you know, if you want to talk about work, write me to Rooster, but please don't leave, don't, don't miss the La Bitcoin this year. Diego, I look forward to uh, having a, a dance of tango with you in November. And uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, thank you so so much for coming on the show and and sharing your insights with us. And hope to speak soon. Thank you for inviting me, Justin, and and, and see you soon. Thank you for listening to this Liberty Entrepreneurs podcast. Our guest today was Diego Gutierrez. Interview and editing by Justin Blinko. If you enjoyed this podcast, please check out our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com, follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or rate us on iTunes. Until the next time.